MOA's translator, Katharina Erbend, whom I far left, has agreed to fill in at the last minute. Katharina, thank you so much for doing this. So Katharina is going to present MOA's book to us. And the second amazing news is that we have the wonderful Aisha Franz with us, who is also going to present MOA's book and her own comic, Shit is Real. And we'll just discuss those two books. Now, Aisha Franz, to my left, was born in 1984 in Fürth. She studied illustration at the Kassel School of Arts. And after graduating, she started working as a freelance illustrator and comic artist. Her first book, Alien, was published by Reprodukt in 2011. Uh, it created quite a stir and was translated into different languages, uh, one of them being English, published in the US by Drawn and Quarterly under the title Earthling. And that book uh, details the day in the life of two sisters and their single mother. It's dealing with issues as like loneliness, childhood, puberty, and sexuality. Aisha's second book is a very different one. It's a wonderful piece of crime writing, I think. Brigitte und der Perlenhort, Bridget and the Pearl Treasure, published in 2012. It's about a crazy secret agent trying to steal a pearl oyster and uh, romancing the mafia. The book she's presenting today is Shit is Real, published in 2016 by Reprodukt as well. It was nominated last year for the LA Times Book Prize. Thank you, Aisha, for being here. Thank you for having me. And Katharina Erben studied comparative English and Scandinavian literature in Berlin and Lund, Sweden. She has been translating comics from the Swedish uh, for a number of years now. You might know her name because she is actually credited as the person who introduced Liv Strömquist to a German audience. It was her idea to translate Liv's comics and present them to a publisher. She's also the translator of Daria Bogdanska and Nana Johansson. And Funny coincidence, this is not the first time Katharina is filling in because two years ago at exactly this festival we are supposed to have a reading with uh, Liv Strömquist who also had to cancel at the last second and Katharina filled in together with Aisha Franz. They did a great job that time so I'm sure it's going to work out this time. They're already a team. Now we're going to start straight away with Aisha's book. Um, Aisha, do you want to take over? Yes, uh, gladly. So uh, I'm going to uh, start with a short reading so you can get an idea uh, of the book, how it looks like and uh, what it is about. And then we'll go over to um, a conversation. <laughs> Damn, come on! Max? Max, can you hear me? Max, can you hear me? Hello, Yumi? Are you there? Yumi, hello? Hello? Why can't anyone hear me? Yumi? Max? Seventeen new messages. Thank God. Beep beep. Access denied. Come on, beep, 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 beep. <gasps> Max, thank God you're home. Um, my key card isn't working for some reason. What's up? Uh, I changed the code. I don't understand. We're done, sorry. Oh, 
Uh, I see. Does that mean I have to move out? Yes. Uh, right now? Yeah, sorry. There's someone new, so... Here's your stuff. So, we're cool? Uh, wait, but, but what about all the stuff we bought together? Ah, glad that you minded me. You should take this guy and the painting, of course. All right, good luck. Thank you, Aisha. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. So, Shit is Real is essentially the story of a woman, Selma. We just saw her in your reading. Her boyfriend breaks up with her in a not very nice way, and then she descends into heartbreak and despair breaks a hole into the wall and starts, this is like what comes right after the end of uh, this excerpt, she starts infiltrating herself in the life of her neighbor, who is, seems to be quite a famous DJ, has an amazing apartment, a great boyfriend, a wonderful washing machine, um, and Selma just realizes that this woman has everything she wants to have, so instead of just striving for that on her own account, she breaks into the apartment and starts living there. Now, um, a Guardian uh, critic said this exuberant, heartbreaking dream story is so obviously the creation of a brilliant but twitchy mind. You might want to approach with caution. I think we are not going to approach with caution today. We'll just throw it to the wind and delve straight into this like really intense story. It's also unsettling, I have to say. The first time I read your book, I was quite in a yeah, very strange emotional state afterwards. Now, um, you depict Berlin, and especially its party scene in your book is a kind of a well of loneliness, which is also a literary topos, I would say, like a metropolis as a well of loneliness. Um, what would you say, what is special about Selma's loneliness in your book? Um, well, uh, I would say that it's, I wanted to depict or try to depict exactly like a more universal, um, uh, state of loneliness that may, maybe many people feel in cities. Um, uh, specifically in this story, um, which also um, kind of brought the idea to write this book was a little bit this moment in life, like shortly before you turn 30, like I felt in my environment, like a lot of friends and people I knew around that age were 
really kind of redefining uh, themselves and uh, like um, leaving things behind and starting something new, but maybe not really knowing yet where to go. It comes ma maybe a little bit from this pressure that you uh, like finally have to, you know, start your life as an adult or something. And I felt like I also had some struggles with this time. You, you, you call it an astrology. There's, I mean, if you, you can believe in it or not, like, <laughs> but it's, I think, a nice um, parable or metaphor that uh, it's Saturn return, um, which you call when Saturn comes back to the same position as your time of birth. And that happens shortly before your 30th uh, birthday in your late 20s. And that comes back every 30 years. And that kind of gives you a, a moment of directionlessness and that you have to kind of like redefine uh, yourself and your own identity. And specifically here, I wanted to depict a woman who is kind of lost with her own identity. She just left a relationship and is left with a question, what, what was me? I, what, who am I actually? Like, what's left of me? And so that's why she is so lost and maybe desperate in a way that she grabs the next possible like opportunity, her cool neighbor who she kind of thinks, wow, like this woman, I want maybe want to be like her. Yeah. So you could say some of the inspiration was biographical from your friend's life, also autobiographical. I assume what other um, literary or artistic references did you have? Which moments or ideas inspired the story? Oh, I think it's uh, like specific literary and artistic references. I think it's always a mix of a lot of things that come. I mean, it takes a long time to write a book like that, right? So like in that time, everything I I read, everything I see and experience or music I listen to and other um, images I see kind of find their way into it. So I couldn't really pin it down, but... Um, yeah, I would say generally, like, the references, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say name any specific references, but more, um, a lot of the references were actually taken from real life experiences, and I always need to fictionalize them in a story, like, I could never write an autobiographical story, but, um, I'm always trying to, like, find this, like, maybe more like a fil film character, you know, this, like, figure. I think it, there is also a little bit film noir in there, you know, and this kind of, like, mood, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't pin it down specifically. Now, what struck me as really interesting is how you use uh, objects and animals in your comic. I mean, we already saw this uh, black cat that's kind of ominous and comes out of uh, the neighbor's apartment, and there's also this weird robot. Later on, um, there's a waitress at the Vietnamese restaurant that Selma always eats at that wears a kind of weird cat mask, and there's also a fish in the aquarium at uh, the restaurant that becomes this kind of creepy interlocutor for for Selma. Now, what would you say, what, what purpose do these animals and objects serve for you in the story? I mean, um, like, for example, specifically the cat or as an animal, but uh, I feel like it has this um, function that it's this, like, voyeur, this this watching instance, someone's watching you from the outside, like you're being watched. Um, because cats kind of do that, right? Like they're always kind of like, I feel like everybody who is, has a cat or, I, I don't have a cat, but there is a scene in the book where she comes out of the uh, shower and is naked and then there's this cat watching um, watching her. And for me, it was a little bit this like these moments that you one has oneself when you live alone and uh, you like still have the feeling you're being watched somehow. So I wanted to be to that be a, a strong kind of like you like as a tool to show that she's kind of has this reflection on herself from the outside. But generally, like anthropomorph, uh, anthro oh god, in English, anthropomorph. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> is like I, I think a great tool in comics um, generally because um, you can do it. You know, I think in other media it's it's harder to switch between or just make an animal like talk. And in comics, you have these great freedoms, you know? It's like the perfect medium to, to just do it. And it wouldn't even seem weird. It's just like part of the story and you can embed it in like really, I don't know, interesting ways. And you kind of add the surreal paranormal element um, without, and, and, and it also kind of like helps to show the alienation, I would say, from humankind. Like that one, I don't know if other people have felt this, but I feel that sometimes. Like sometimes I'm like, who are these people? Am, I'm, am I really one of them, you know? <laughs> and then you like, you see an animal and you like feel maybe a little bit more attached to the animal in that moment because you're like totally lost uh, otherwise, identifying with humans. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and that's what uh, happens to Selma at some point. Like, the longer she stares at that specific fish in the aquarium, the more the fish seems to like be human, start talking to her. And even as a reader, at some point, you can't really be sure anymore if this fish isn't maybe another human being communicating with Selma. And then later on, it gets even wackier when the aquarium just disappears. And when Selma asks the waitress, where's the aquarium? And she says, like, what aquarium? <laughs> what fish? <laughs> like, was it just all uh, in your mind? And and I think what helps the reader to really um, delve so deep into your characters is your particular visual style, which I find very distinct, very iconic. Um, these pencil drawings, black and gray, there's a lot of white. Um, Selma's facial expressions are often curiously empty. I mean, you know what her feelings should be because her boyfriend dumped her, she's unhappy. At the same time, her face is just blank. Um, and sometimes when she's playing with her phone, for example, example, you really merge the kind of digital and real personas in, in the image. So I was wondering how you would explain this particular drawing style you're using um, for the book to fuse an analog, a virtual, and an imaginary state. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to, in a visual work, um, able to shift seamlessly between those re these realities so the readers can follow and kind of sense there something's happening or like there's somewhere else in this moment. So you also have to, of course, um, do it uh, do it visually, you know? Like uh, I think uh, all, uh, artists have different ways to do it, but um, for each like surreal layer, I find like a specific style to kind of like show, okay, you're somewhere else now, but also to not focus on that too much because you, you're supposed to just follow the story and not think about it too much. Oh, where am I right now? Like, where is this? What is, what, why is there a fish uh, talking? Um, and I think, yeah, like you apply specific rules, no, for your own uh, story, um, which works, what works and what not. Like you can't just randomly um, shift to a, a specific um, th uh, layer or a specific uh, a time and space. Um, so um, I don't know, I like in this example, in this water example, like the, the panels look different and you kind of apply a little bit. And so when she uh, also turns into an emoji or sometimes she's just walking and her um, appearance changes into like a cute uh, figure or very tall, it also just kind of exaggerates maybe her insecurities, like you feel small, suddenly you sm feel very big. So I think that's the great things again about comics that you can incorporate it like very easily into an image and just leave it be, you know, um, to the interpretation. Now some reviewers have classified your book as a, a dream story because there are so many scenes like the first one we just saw, um, the breakup, that seems a bit like a dream. I mean, it's set in the middle of a desert and in the end the city disintegrates. In my opinion, um, the book is a lot more, it's, it's dealing with a lot more than just mere dreams. It's about different states of perception and dreams 
being only one of them. Um, how would you characterize Selma's um, different states of being, of perception, and what induces them? I mean, um, she is just, uh, she's clearly, um, yeah, in, the, in, that, in that specific story, in that moment, she is, yeah, very lonely, like there's no one really she can open up to. So um, I shift between these uh, surreal elements, like every time, like she can't really deal with a situation in real life, it kind of turns into this more fantastic world because also to show, like I like to rather show things than explain them. Like I didn't want to do a dialogue where she explains how she's feeling. I want to, I always try to find ways to show it. So again, like I, I use this incredible freedom in comics to just do whatever I can to avoid explaining things, you know? And I really like uh, uh, also in other media, like when you don't really know and like you can look into, you have the feeling you can look into someone's mind. I wanted also the readers more to, to go out of, uh, of it, not like, like maybe a little bit not knowing whether they had actually read the book or not, like it's, I think that's for me, um, a nice way of putting it because that's also a feedback I got from some people and I think that's important that you kind of just go with it and you're like in her mind and in the end yes you maybe don't know what's real or not and it's just but it's fine I don't want to you know like in some of these like I feel like an example like these Charlie Kaufman movies you know they're like sometimes very <laughs> like ooh, like, time is not linear, you know? And I don't want it to be that, like, in your face, direct, like, dealing with this. I just want it to be part of the story. You don't question it. It's just like you dive in and you dive out. Well, you say we don't know what's real, but we do know that shit is real. I mean, <laughs> it's right on the cover of um, the book. I think that's one of the great strengths of your comic, that it's so open to interpretation, that it refuses to just allow for one meaning. Um, one very common reading um, of your book is that it's to do with mental health or mental illness. I mean, is Selma depressed? Is she psychotic because she starts talking to a fish that then disappears? Um, in how far would you say your book actually deals with this topic? Or is Selma maybe just very sad because of the breakup? I mean, first of all, um the breakup isn't really a topic in the book. Like, it's not about, like, heartbreak. It's just, it doesn't really matter. She's just, like, you know, it's just, like, the beginning of the story. And and I I, I think it's fi totally fine, or I also welcome people to read, uh, to read it the way, um, or understand it the way they want. Like, if someone understands it as reading um, depression into it, that's fine, I think. Because also, like... Uh, normally, like, I think the line is very hard to define, you know, um, for when when uh, does a depression start and when is it just like a phase I'm going through. Like, I, I don't want to make a clear line, so maybe it's even, it could turn into a depression or maybe it's just like a way to to um, depict someone's struggles in a specific moment with a specific situation. So um, yes, it could be read as depression and I think that's totally fine, but I don't think I, I wanna pin it down to that. So it's, I think it's more nebulous, like, I don't know. For me, it's always also hard. Like, I mean, we all struggle with certain things in life and you, you can't really say like, is it already, you know, when is it gone? Like what is a mild form of maybe a mental health issue and we are all kind of like, it's, it's a very nebulous area. So I think um, with that book, I wasn't, like she's not going to a therapist or, you know, it's, a, it's, it's more oblique, I would say. Um, well, Moa Romanova's identikit is not oblique in that sense at all. Um, Moa is very open about her own mental health issues and dealing with them in her comic. Um, identikit was published this year by Avan Verlag. Identikit is the German title. The original Swedish is, I'm probably saying this wrong now, <laughs> Katharina Altid Fucker Up. Always fuck Altid up. Altid Fucker Up. <laughs> yeah, this is how it should be. So always fuck up. In English, the title is Goblin Girl. 
Um, so for me, that's also an interesting point. How Sorry, what's the English title? Goblin Girl? Goblin Girl. Published by Fantagraphics, they chose a totally different Goblin title Girl. for some reason. Yeah, maybe that's something we could discuss later. Moa um, is a visual artist, sculptor, comic artist, and musician. She studied at the University for Visual Arts in Gothenburg and the Comic Art School in Malmö. Identikit is, as I said, highly autobiographical. It's based on her own diaries, and it tells the story of a 20-something battling depression and anxiety and then ending up on Tinder, where she meets a TV celebrity who is meant to turn her life around, but then he doesn't really. Katarina, um, did you meet Moa in Sweden? How did you f find, how did you get to know her work? No, I've never met her in person. My um, lovely publisher introduced this book to me and suggested we should make a comic out of this. And were you immediately excited about it? I read an interview with you where you said that the first time you read the book you were totally unsettled and the second time you found it very funny. I yes, think. it really changes. The first time I read it I thought it was very depressing. But the second time around I noticed all the humor in it. She's really making fun of her own state of mind in a way. She's very aware about her own depression which manifests in herself as uh, a lack of motivation, she can't, can't get stuff done. And this state is interlaced with panic attacks. And she really makes fun of herself having these panic attacks and not getting stuff done in between all this suffering, you see. And the second time I read the comic, I was admiring her strength to talk about this illness in such a humorous way. It was really funny. Aisha, now I know that you're also a big fan of Moa's. What was your initial response to the comic? Actually, I have to say very similar to, to yours. I mean, I was... Uh, yeah, I hadn't read something in that way. Also, the way she draws it, of course, adds a, this a specific layer. Like, you can't look away. It's, it's drawn in a very funny way. Also, how she depicts herself. And, and um, I, I like that it was also like a woman that goes through life and just stuff happens to her and she deals with it and it's like it's yeah it's it's very also very unsettling like you kind of know oh my god like she's really dealing with these heavy issues but you read it and you laugh and you kind of really also understand it better also how she interacts with her her the people around her and her mother like, yeah, uh, similar yes. like you. I and her friends and are I really taking good yeah. care of her. She has a group of friends, girlfriends, who are really lovely and supportive. And it was fun to see the girls interact in this comic, too. It's not only this, the famous Tinder date. <laughs> yeah, actually, the Tinder date is uh, right there. The guy with a paper bag on his head. I mean, he's so famous, such a famous Swedish TV celeb that you are not allowed to know his name or even see his face. And he's also 53 and uh, wants to become Moa's uh, sugar daddy. He's quite open about that. Um, and then to the right, you see her best friend, I think Sara is her name, speaking in these funny uh, ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. She's um, actually the one looking after Moa at uh, a lot of turning points in her life. Um, Katarina, no, but l maybe let's focus a little bit on these friendships Moa has with other girls who are all like very active in the Gothenburg party scene. I mean, a lot of scenes are set at parties where everyone is uh, having fun, taking drugs, dancing, and then Moa is sitting there in her jumper. At some point, her friends even say, why do you always wear these sad boy clothes? Like, you look terrible. No one's ever going to like you. Um, so they make a lot of fun of her. At the same time, they support her in a really incredible way. Um, how would you say this evolves as the comic moves on? Because in the beginning, of course, Moa is in a very bad place, and then she kind of does um, go through different phases and makes some sort of development. Would you say that her circle of friends develops alongside her, or are they all on different levels dealing with their own issues? No, I think they're supportive all the time, and I don't see anything changing along the story. I, if you, you might want to contradict, but I didn't notice any changes in these relationships. But um, you see, it's the other 
the other way around as well. You see her supporting her friends. For example, one of her friends, I think it was Osa. She has uh, some disease. At oh, right, yeah, an STI. They go to a gynecologist. Yeah, yeah, they go to they go to uh, a what? a gynecologist, I think. Right. But, but but it's something immediate. What, the ER for gynecology, <laughs> where she has to where she shows her STDs, and uh, all her friends are supporting her. I feel like they just take each other however they are. It doesn't matter, you know, like if someone has like a mental illness and I think that's what's so great about it, you know, and that's how also as a reader you see the character, you just take her as she is. Yeah, so it's interesting that Moa gets a lot of support from her friends, but then there's also a psychologist in her life who's actually the one supposed to support her. We're going to skip a few of those scenes. Yeah, this woman, she's supposed to support Moa, of course, as a professional, but she doesn't really. I mean, she always, uh, she, she's uh, just using all these platitudes to tell Moa, ah, life is going to be okay. You are not going to die if you have a panic attack. Just breathe. <laughs> exactly. Then she does all these crazy breathing exercises. Um, and she also, I mean, there are all these funny little details in the comic, like, for example, maybe you could see it here, the psychology, the psychologist wears a funny little uh, mushroom brooch. And um, how did you interpret these details, Katarina, as you were translating the comic? Did you actually focus on them at all? Because they're on the visual level, so you're not translating them, of course. How important are the, those quirky details for you in the comic? Well, for me, I, I, rather, I focused on the language, and there's a lot of quirks in the language as well. Uh, young people talking and inserting, for example, emojis into their spoken language. And I, th I thought it's similar to this, those in images inserted into other images and the quirky details in the language inserted into spoken word. I have to say the German version reads so natural. I mean, it, you used a lot of, uh, of course, German online slang, Instagram digital slang. Um, did you find it very difficult to translate that from the Swedish? There are also a lot of English words in there, which I assume are in the Swedish original, original as well. Did you have to create a new language or did you just talk to your daughters and figure out what they would say and then you put uh, that The in language the was really wonderful. I really loved talking to young people and... <laughs> and getting the feel of this language. There's a lot of um, specific, Moa said it was specific Gothenburg, the beginning of the 20th century slang, 21st century slang. And she had to explain to me a few of her own idiosyncrasies, but the language is the most fun in this. Yeah, we're always saying Moa because obviously, I mean, this main character is called Moa. It is Moa in a way. She she says, this is me, this is how I see myself as well. And now you can see the, ah, yeah, this is the funny mushroom brooch that the psychologist wears, which I find actually super creepy. I feel like if I attended her sessions, I would probably walk out after. I wasn't sure if, it, if the psychologist is a woman or a man because it doesn't say in Swedish. I just yeah, right. And I think I made her a woman, just going with the feeling. You see her breasts in one of the, when she bows forwards, but it might have as well have been a man. I wasn't really sure if I should make a woman out of this, because in the Swedish, the, the grammar is indifferent to the job description. Yeah, you already mentioned that a few times as, uh, when you were talking about your translations of Liv Strömquist and Daria Bogdanska. Of course, in, Swe in the Swedish original, they, you can never be sure of a noun um, or a group of people if it's males or females, but then in German, you have to kind of make a choice or you use the gender Sternchen, which of course was a big issue with the Daria Bogdanska translation. Some people uh, took offense because you used uh, the, the asterisk. Um, how far would you say is it actually possible to translate this very specific uh, gender-neutral Swedish language that has also become such a normal thing for the younger generation into German? How much do you have to adapt and how much gets lost in translation? 
Well, I did have to make a choice if it's, if it's a girl or a boy psychologist here and, or a woman psychologist. I made a choice. I have to adapt the German language. Did you ask Moa about it? Was it uh, a question she asked herself no, or was it she I, indifferent to it? It's funny that you mention it. It's, it's a good thing. I should have asked her, shouldn't I? All right, we move on to the next question. Well, the next scene, um, as you already see here, is a very drastic one. Um, Moa in the book says that her whole battle with mental illness started after she uh, smoked spice and then had a really kind of psychotic episode, a really bad trip, um, which you see here. This is one of her friends with who she was smoking, one of these girlfriends. They're smoking spice and then she goes into this very crazy underworld, um, a bit twin peaky actually, if you think about it. Yeah, this is uh, just to give you an idea of the different visual styles Moa uses. It's not always the same. What is always similar is that her characters are these kind of crazy giants, like with massive feet, but really tiny heads. And um, I think that's one of the things that really unsettled me the first time I read the comic, that um, the characters look so weird. They have these big feet and big ears, and then the face is so small, and often, as in your comic, Aisha, often the faces are just blank. I mean, there are no facial expressions sometimes. Um, now, this question goes to both of you. How did you read this visual style? How would you describe it? How would you interpret it? I, I, I mean, I have to say, honestly, as an artist myself, I don't <laughs> usually read, so like, I don't try to interpret so much into the style. I mean, I discovered Moore's work very, quite late, I guess, with that book. So for me, um, it was kind of out of question. I thought that's maybe how she draws people, honestly. I <laughs> thought it, it was, first of all, it's the allusion to Twin Peaks with the woman in the hat. But then the friend she, that she's accompanying with, oh, go back another page, because the friend up there in the picture, I think this is another comic artist. I think this is Ellen Greyer. Um, who wrote um, a lunchbox comic, uh, which was very famous in Sweden a few years ago, two years ago. And I think that's her in the... When Ellen Greyer's style is a bit like this. So I thought she was making a reference to her friend. Um, now, you mentioned other Swedish comic artists. Um, I would say in Germany, we often tend to think that, of course, the Swedes do everything better, and they're also much better at dealing with mental health or talking about mental health. I'm not sure how much this is actually true or <laughs> in how far you would contradict this assumption. But would you say that MOA is specific within the Swedish comic scenes in dealing with mental health issues in such an authentic, raw, and open way? Or are there other artists doing similar things? Um. Talking about Ellen Greyer, for example, she, um, her comic is about a young girl selling porn online because, of, because she feels depressed. <laughs> so I think um, there are similarities. And I wouldn't say that the Swedish community is more open about mental illness. I wouldn't know. But there, there are no other artists that work on this topic in similar ways, apart from the one, Ellinger, you mentioned. It's not like a trend or a thing in Swedish no, it's comics? No, it's not a trend. <laughs> because uh, Moa is also very um, clear in saying that for her, talking about her mental health issues is a way of empowerment. Because I read in one interview uh, she did with uh, Jetzt.de that if... She said, if I've already told the world about these issues I have, then no one can out me publicly, you know? No one can say publicly, but you have these issues. And for her, um, this is uh, very empowering, and I can totally understand that. At the same time, there are, of course, secrets in the book as well. I mean, we never find out who this TV uh, celebrity is. We can see him in that, yeah, that double page kind of deals with her conflicting relationship with this man who she matched with on Tinder and immediately found creepy, but at the same time 
she's interested, so she meets up in the bar with him, and then he says, oh, I love you more, I want to maybe not get married, but be with you, and she's like, oh, no, what, <laughs> who, what did I get myself into? But they continue messaging, and he says, I love your art, I want to support you financially, I want to, he doesn't say sugar daddy, but this is actually, kind of feels like that's what her girlfriend say, like he wants to be your sugar daddy, but just go with it, because maybe he can actually help you. And then she ends up in this crazy emotional place where she isn't sure if he's supporting her really or if he, yeah, what he's actually looking for. Well, he claims to support her art and he claims to, that he's interested in her because she's such a beautiful artist. So in the end, she feels deceived that she finds out that she really was playing at being her sugar daddy. Because then there's a pivotal scene where she gets a tattoo and she writes to him, okay, look now, I just got a tattoo, and then suddenly he stops communicating with her and she like messages him, messages him like 5,000 times and he just never replies. And at some point, um, one of her friends says, ah, oh, but I do remember this guy has some issue with tattoos. And she goes on the internet and finds this article where the TV celeb made a kind of list, like the 25 things a woman should have for her to be my queen. Like, I'm looking for my queen. And then one thing on the list is she may not have a tattoo. And then Moa suddenly realizes that maybe he was in love with her or he was looking she for She should clearly release his name. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not sure. Actually, does anyone know the name of this TV celeb, uh, Katarina? I, I assume there are many in Sweden. Needs many to be uh, cancelled. <laughs> For sure. They're all TV celebs. Maybe we should all do some more research. But in the end, it isn't even important like who this guy is. It's just an older man who's supporting her, but at the same time also um, maybe exploiting, maybe exploiting her vulnerability as well. But. Um, as I said before, there is some sort of development, also a positive one. Um, she doesn't get stuck in those uh, panicky episodes, but uh, at some point realizes that she can deal with them and that she actually does not die, that she survives, which is like this platitude her psychologist told her. But she realizes that it's actually also true. I mean, she doesn't die. And then there's, these, there's this very amazing scene where she's lonely, sits in the forest, it's cold, she's wearing her scarf, she starts looking at her hands and suddenly she morphs into this uh, uh, Japanese uh, fighter. I don't want to say princess because uh, she looks more like a fighter to me. Yeah, and again you see suddenly the visual style changes totally and um, this is kind of the scene where she finds her strength, where she realizes, okay, I'm strong, I have this diamond encrusted sword, I can deal with the situation, and she ends up confronting her fear, and this fear is a very creepy character. Yeah, you see it here, this kind of, this kind of black sticky thing, I mean, it has two eyes, apart from that you wouldn't know if it's a being or if it's just, yeah, an, an, an entity, um, and this is essentially what she's battling, but you never find out um, if she slays this demon or not, because um, as she's just going to raise her sword, she comes out of this dream and wakes up, which is a, a similar technique, I would say, to um, what Aisha's using sometimes in, in her book, like these dreams that cut out at some point and you don't know. Um, you, you just can imagine, as a reader, you just imagine how this ends. Like, will she slay the demon? Maybe she won't. Maybe it will just always be there. Maybe that's not the whole um, point of the thing. So, as I said, the first time I read the comic, I was very unsettled. The second time, I was still unsettled. So I'm not at the funny stage yet, but I was wondering how, how positively you should read the ending. I don't know how you um, perceive the very last scenes when um, she sits, um, kind of sits quietly down and then flowers bloom up around her and she says, okay, life goes on. I mean, in that scene, clearly she describes how she dealt with a panic attack in a way that got her out of it so it was more like a, or maybe it's going a good direction but I think the whole um, just the fact that she made that book and if that's really I mean it's clearly there's very many autobiographical elements that I read into it I don't know I haven't didn't have the chance to meet her to ask her that but 
So there is this one moment where she gets a rejection from an art school um, where she's applied to and uh, and then she has this whole story going on with this man uh, to support her art or something and um, and she's in this slow moment where she maybe what I like also is that she, or find interesting she never really condemns this guy it's almost like she really needed that that in that moment in her life to get her to this point of the last few pages and I mean in the end we are holding this book in our hands like she made a whole book about that so clearly she turned it all into a, a somewhat happy ending I'm sure this nev always haunts you and it's not just like that that you can leave uh, uh, your mental health issues as, uh, behind you obviously not but she made this book so of course you know the, the ending for me means something positive in a way. The very last scene, if I co remember correctly, then she describes going to the movies with one of her friends and um, she has a panic attack at the beginning of the, before the film had even started and she needs to know where all the emergency exits are and then she remembers, this will go over. This will go over. This smell. Is this my feet smelling here? And then... <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> in, in that moment, she notices something funny. And I thought it was hilarious. Now, I have one last question for you, Aisha. Um, something that links both of these books, I think, is that they both deal with very powerful, also universal human emotions, like love and loss and loneliness and despair. Um, and I was wondering, do you need extra skill? I feel like I tell stories because otherwise I couldn't make sense of everything that's happening. And it really helps me to reflect on myself because I'm very bad at it in normal life. So it's the other way around. Actually, for me, it's um, essential. And it's the on maybe the only way I can really pin it down. So it comes in a way easy I would say because it's essential but of course you have to make that leap to make it relatable maybe for others and that is maybe the hardest step because you you don't want to just you know I I'm making this book for readers not just for myself. Um, thank you again for being here for the 10th anniversary of Graphic Novel Day and hope to see you next year in the same location. Thank you. <laughs>